So it's James A. Byard in 1864, a lecture to be delivered now by Dr. Jonathan Russ. We'll follow with a question, a very brief question and answer period. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Jonathan Russ. Thank you, Scott, for that generous <coughs> introduction. Good evening, everyone. It's a great pleasure to be here, particularly as we're here in part, of course, to celebrate the 150th anniversary of the Historical Society. It's, it's important to note, of course, that the Historical Society is uh, one of the largest repositories, holds the, the largest bulk of documents on James Byard. And of course, other documents are held by the State Archives and by the Library of Congress. But I think it does highlight the importance uh, to researchers whether they be amateur or professionals uh, of our historical societies and the rich resources that are, are contained here. So I do want to especially thank the Historical Society for its work in, in that regard. James Ashton Byard, Jr. One of the most important nuanced minds who was a member of the United States Senate during the Civil War, between the war between the states. And yet, <clears throat> remarkably little scholarship has been done on him. We see scholarship being done on the abolitionists. There's, there's volumes, of course, written about Charles Sumner, Thaddeus Stevens, obviously of Mr. Lincoln. Likewise, volumes on the secessionists, on those people like Jefferson Davis of the Confederacy. And yet, why do we see less scholarship on someone who is a critic of the administration, who is worried of the direction the country is taking during the Civil War under the Lincoln administration, but is a loyal Unionist. Now, James Byard, of course, would not fare terribly well, probably, in today's political environment. Few politicians of his generation would. These are not people who speak in nice little sound bites or who make a snappy appearance on a camera for, for a matter of seconds, no. These are nuanced thinkers. These are people who explain their ideas at great length, both on the floor of the Congress and in their written correspondence. We're fortunate, of course, to have all of this correspondence. One of the great challenges facing historians of modern American history, particularly those people who studied the 20th century, is that so much is conducted by telephone. that We don't have a good idea of what certain meetings and conversations had, they, they, they are lost. Well, unless you're talking about the Nixon White House. But otherwise, <laughs> most of it's lost. We don't have a good sense of, of what's happened. And perhaps it's become a little easier for future historians of the 21st century, but then, too, we're looking at little blips and sound bites and tweets. Um, it's, it's difficult to understand the deeper thoughts of some of these folks. So we are fortunate to, to have this. But back to my original query. How is it that Byard doesn't have the sufficient amount of scholarly attention that he so richly deserves? Well, I think in part it has to do not with 1864, but with 1865, when, of course, on the night of April the 14th, John Wilkes Booth assassinates. Abraham Lincoln. A few days before, on April the 9th, of course, Robert E. Lee had surrendered to Ulysses S. Grant. And although that did not mark the official end of the Civil War, it was clearly the beginning of the end. When Lee's Army of Northern Virginia had surrendered, it was only a matter of time. And so Washington was filled with jubilation. At long last, the bloodiest conflict in the history of the United States was over. 
Lincoln, for his part, didn't necessarily feel like celebrating. More than anything, he was exhausted. But nevertheless, he understood the mood of the people around him and, and did his best to make public appearances, which included going to the theater on the night of the 14th. The play they saw was entitled My American Cousin. It was a British comedy, and Mrs. Lincoln very much so wanted to go. He did not. He, in fact, wanted to see another show entitled Aladdin and His Magic Lamp. But <clears throat> Mrs. Lincoln wanted to go, so they went to Ford's Theater. They invited the Grants to join them, but uh, Mrs. Grant didn't like Mrs. Lincoln and made it perfectly clear that General Grant had to go personally and decline the invitation to President Lincoln. Grant was not terribly excited about this duty, but he would rather do that than uh, find himself with an angry Mrs. Grant. So he went and declined the invitation, and the Lincolns proceeded without them. Well, once they're in the theater, of course, the theater itself, Ford's Theater, that was Good Friday. Good Friday is not one of your more popular evenings for theater performances. Um, they had expected a relatively empty house, but with the announcement that the Lincolns would be there, they quickly ran advertisements and the theater was full for people anticipating this performance, this appearance by the Lincolns. Well, the Lincolns were late in arriving, but that was okay. The crowd, nevertheless, was pleased to see them there. And what no one knew, of course, was that John Wilkes Booth lay in waiting. Booth, remarkably, was very well known. This is in part how he chose Ford's theater. He was one of the best known actors of his generation, one of the highest paid actors in the country. He was known north and south, had performed before the war, and so he had little difficulty finding his way in, knew his way around, and of course didn't arouse any suspicion. The actors knew him, the stagehands knew him, the Ford brothers knew him. So when he snuck in to the presidential box. Nobody thought much of it. Locked the door to the box behind him, stepped up behind President Lincoln, and with a single shot pistol, the Derringer, shot President Lincoln in the head. At which point, he drops his pistol. He's still armed with a dagger. Firearms at the time were notoriously unreliable. And so he brought a dagger just in case the pistol didn't function, but it did. But still with his dagger in hand, he leapt off of the booth, off the balcony, onto the stage. And brandishing his knife, called out in a loud voice, Sic Semper Tyrannis, thus always to tyrants. Those words are attributed to Brutus, the assassination of Caesar. And always the showman, John Wilkes Booth wanted to make this grand statement so that he could, could be noted, right? He's not sneaking, he's not hiding. There he is, in full view of everyone. And then he disappears behind the curtains and is fleeing for the next 12 days. Journey took him through southern Maryland into Virginia, when ultimately the barn in which he was hiding was surrounded. Although his co-conspirator had, had surrendered, Booth refused to and ultimately was killed. I point this out because that phrase, thinking of Lincoln as a tyrant, was one that James Byard himself had used. But of course, he never meant that Lincoln should be assassinated, that he should be murdered, simply that he disagreed with the policies of the administration and its actions in office. But of course, this cast a whole cloud over the atmosphere. Only days before, Bard's house had been surrounded by a mob that demanded that the United States flag be, be put out and hung for all to see. Now, he wasn't there, but, but the people who were you know, put it out right away, lest, lest events get out of control. 
For to be even questioning Lincoln in that moment was to be seen as disloyal, perhaps even to be a traitor. This label was not new to Bayard. He was accustomed to being falsely accused of this, saw himself as the loyal opposition. But nevertheless, in that moment, of course, Abraham Lincoln, who was controversial, right? I mean, only 39% of Americans voted for Lincoln in the 1860 election. But nevertheless, in his murder, of course, he's lifted to, to martyr status, right? considered to be one of our finest presidents, if not the finest president, the great emancipator. Well, he was more controversial in his day. And had he survived through Reconstruction, the difficulty of, of binding together a country after this long and divisive war, his reputation may well have been different. But he becomes frozen in time with his assassination, frozen in a moment of victory for the Union, even though grave questions remained for the United States. Well, when he began his career, of course, Bayard didn't, didn't face all of that. Born in, in 1799, he had a, a fine upbringing, certainly exposed to fine education, good background, matriculated to Princeton, which of course was a family tradition of sorts. But, <clears throat> Uh, of course, often with a fine mind goes high spirits. And he did not graduate from Princeton. And after, after some hijinks, uh, was asked to find another institution. And he did. His family ended up sending him to Union College in New York, where he graduated in 1819. It's interesting to note because as political troubles weighed heavily on him before and certainly during the Civil War, New York State became a favorite respite of his to, to vacation, to collect his thoughts. And it was in his youth that, that he had first grown to love the state. Of course, he's sandwiched between a number of, of famous bards. I mean, his, his father, of course, after all, James Byard Sr., helped to author the Treaty of Ghent, which, of course, I'm sure you're, you've all read uh, recently. Uh, the Treaty of Ghent, uh, of course, was the treaty in 1814 that ended the War of 1812. The War of 1812, the war that essentially f completes the unfinished business of the revolution, forming the borders of the United States to the west and firming them up with Canada to the north. Of course, his son goes on to his own brilliant political career Thomas F. Baird, of course, becomes Secretary of State in the first Cleveland administration and U.S. Ambassador to Great Britain in the second. Much has been written on both of their achievements. But Baird, of course, took a riskier path. At first, that didn't seem obvious. He read law under Lewis McLean. McLean, of course, himself the subject of, of much scholarship. And in so doing, went on to form a, a lucrative law practice, always with a certain amount of political ambition, so that in 1850, he eventually was elected to the United States Senate. Elected, of course, not by popular vote, the direct election of senators does not come about until the 17th Amendment to the Constitution in 1913. Instead, he's elected by the Delaware legislature. So his fellow Delawareans put him into the Senate. This is how the Constitution, of course, was originally written, to insulate the Senate from the vagaries of public opinion. The framers were skeptical of the popular vote, were skeptical of the people. Far better to leave these matters in, in quieter, more studied hands. Well, 1850 was a controversial year 
in American politics. Owing all to the Mexican-American War, fought between 1846 and 1848, it's the Mexican-American War, of course, that, that leaves the United States with vast new amounts of territory. Half of modern-day Texas, New Mexico, Arizona, California. And the question immediately arises with this new territory. Should this territory, once it eventually is divided into states, should those states be admitted as free states with free labor, or should they be admitted as slave states? Immediately, that military victory is overshadowed by this question. And it first arises, it first becomes most intense in California, because, of course, what accompanies the end of the Mexican-American War is the discovery of gold in California. And so suddenly California finds itself populated, not only by the native population that, of course, had long been there, not only by the Spanish missionaries who had long been there, but now by hundreds and then thousands of people who sought their fortunes. And so the question arose almost immediately, what about California? How should it be admitted? I mean, then as now, California is among the most fertile places on earth. Obviously, it's suffering through severe drought at the moment, but historically, one can grow nearly anything in California. And so, of course, it's attractive to agriculturists of all stripes. People who want to acquire land and, and start anew, start fresh. As well as planters who are finding their soils exhausted and looking for new opportunities. And of course, for those planters, particularly those in tobacco and in cotton and indigo and rice, that meant bringing their slaves with them. And so that is the political battle of the day. What should happen to these states? And that is where we first see James Byard's political thinking start to crystallize when it becomes a matter of public record. He's concerned because many of his fellow Democrats particularly Stephen Douglas of Illinois, want these states to be admitted and to have that question be decided by popular sovereignty, by a popular vote. That's what's contained in Douglas's Kansas-Nebraska Act. Should these states, should the population of these states be allowed to decide for themselves? Bayard thought this was a terrible idea. That, of course, either side of the aisle could, could either side of the debate could, and they did, rush people to these territories to try to sway the outcome of the election. In fact, he went out of his way in the selection process in 1856 to make sure that Stephen Douglas did not get the Democratic nomination. And of course, that was to pave the way for controversy, for strife between these two lawmakers. Ultimately, James Buchanan, the Democrat, wins the election. Interestingly, it's John C. Fremont of California who runs on the Republican ticket in that election. Buchanan wins handily. The Republicans are relatively new, certainly controversial, certainly an untested political party at the time. And Fremont, of course, himself, although rises in reputation over time, is still something of an unknown entity. Well, Buchanan wrestled with this for his presidency. It certainly didn't turn out terribly well for him. And so in 1860, it was clear that this was going to be a whole new slate of candidates who were presented 
to the American voters. The American voters, of course, at the time, are free white men over the age of 21 who would be making this decision. Abraham Lincoln, of course, secures the nomination of his party. John C. Bell secures the nomination of what was known as the Constitutional Union Party. But the Democrats split. The Democrats split north and south. When the Democratic Convention was held in Charleston, the convention ended without the selection of a candidate. It was a failed convention. Of course, political conventions in the era were far different than what we see today, right? I mean, Today, they're scripted. We know who the nominees are. The primary process has determined that. So when we tune in to either major party's political convention, we, we know what lies ahead of us. A week of speeches, a week of, of flag waving, and a whole lot of balloons getting dropped from the ceiling with some ill-chosen popular music that's no longer popular. Uh, being, being played as the candidates are presented, and we now know who the candidates will be. But of course, in this era, those conventions truly did battle it out and select who their party's candidate for office would be. These were backroom deals. These were smoke-filled rooms. These were conventions that could end up on the floor in fisticuffs. It was real political theater. So real, in fact, that as I said, the Democrats could not decide upon a candidate. They tried again in Baltimore a few weeks later, and it too ended in failure. So that ultimately the Democrats ran two candidates, Stephen Douglas of Illinois, as a Northern Democrat, still clinging to his idea of popular sovereignty, and John C. Breckinridge, the candidate representing Southern Democrats, who surely wanted to preserve the institution of slavery and, as he saw it, preserve the ability of individuals to have property rights. Obviously, that language is uncomfortable in the 21st century. The idea of thinking of human beings as property, but that is how these debates rolled out. It wasn't about morality. It wasn't about ethics. It was about property. And should planters have the ability to take their property with them where they so chose? Which brings us to Delaware politics. John C. Breckinridge won handily in Delaware. Bell came in second, Lincoln came in third, and Stephen Douglas came in fourth. This would essentially mirror Baird's own thinking. And so he was a fair and, and good broker of the state's people. Of course, as I had noted, only 39% of the popular vote had gone for Lincoln. But nevertheless, he did garner the most votes, and so was elected president. Within weeks of his election, of course, begins secession. Southern states seceding from the Union ultimately to form their own country, the Confederate States of America. They had sent representatives to Delaware in the winter of 1861 to see if Delaware would be interested in siding with the Confederacy. After all, Delaware was a slave state. And it was pointed out to Delaware lawmakers that there were economic advantages to Delaware joining 
the Confederacy. It was, particularly in Newcastle County, among the more industrial of the slaveholding states, and surely would find a large number of customers further south looking for machinery and ships and gunpowder manufactured here. In a confederacy that promised low tariffs on imported goods, Delaware ports surely would become busy as foreign ships came to sell their goods. Well, Delaware lawmakers didn't quite see it that way, although maybe there was some truth to that. Obviously, there were problems with this argument. Delaware lawmakers, Byard in particular, wrote extensively on this, obviously had to keep their eye on their neighbors. In such a small state, Delaware had to monitor how Virginia and how Maryland would act. If they seceded, then perhaps secession could be a viable option. But as it became clear that ultimately Maryland would not, it also became clear that Delaware could not. Surely it would be surrounded by Union states and would soon thereafter be occupied. Of course, there were other interests fighting against secession. In no small way, of course, Delawareans were proud of being the first state of the United States of America. And to leave that behind meant something to people, as did the cause of abolition. Between Delaware's Quakers and Methodists, there were a large number of people who believed in abolition. Despite Delaware being a slave state, it was not a vibrant part of its economy. Yes, it was an old part of Delaware's tradition, but this was a state instead with a large free black population, unlike its southern counterparts. And then, too, there are the DuPonts, the DuPont interests were very interested in remaining in the Union, and as the largest producer of explosives and powders in the region, they would form an important part of Delaware's connection to the Civil War on the side of the Union. Shortly after the first shots were fired, over Fort Sumter, as the Confederacy grew in size to 11 of the former United States. Bayard was serving in Washington, where, as the violence spread and unfolded, he wrote to his son that he was feeling lonely and sad over the blood and slaughter of the war. He thought the war was ill-fated, that in prosecuting the war that the Lincoln administration was fundamentally wrong on its reading of the Constitution. He firmly believed that the Republic was just that. It was a republic, it was a, a, a consolidation of various sovereign states. It was a confederation itself. And to force states back into the fold that had revolted, for he saw this as a revolution, on their part, he thought that the United States fundamentally had no constitutional business to do so. In fact, he went on to reason that the only way the United States could 
legally wage war against the Confederacy would be to recognize the Confederate States as a legitimate country, to have formal diplomatic relations with the Confederate States of America. Because then, by so doing, this would be war against a foreign country. And that, of course, there was long precedence for. Moreover, he reasoned that the United States had reasonable diplomatic relations with Spain, reasonable diplomatic relations with Brazil, two countries that still practiced slaveholding. If that could be the case, why not have diplomatic relations with the Confederate States of America? Treat that as a foreign country. He went on to reason, of course, that if war was to be the result, how could the Union be put back together by force? Surely that would not work. He despaired that his fellow lawmakers simply didn't understand the constitutional issues, that they were too unstudied, too vulgar, to appreciate precisely what lay before them. As he wrote during the early days of the war, and I quote, I have now scarcely a hope that under a system of universal suffrage, a republic can stand with this concentration of wealth and luxury. Politics had become a purpose of livelihood, and the ignorance of men elected for legislative purposes is so great that it is impossible to save corruption within moderate bounds. Well, now those words are so present, don't they? Uh, <coughs> and there's, there's uh, an observation here, of course, just who are these people? And are they here to profit from this or to truly serve for a period of time the nation's larger interests? He went on. by war to keep the states united, to restore the union, but the attempt will be futile. Conciliation and concession may reunite us, but war, never. How to put back together a country after a protracted war. He's one of the few voices in Congress that are asking this fundamental question. Of course, most of his fellow Democrats, most of whom come from southern states, were gone. The so-called peace Democrats in many cases had lost their elections in their northern districts. His was a rare voice in the middle. Union, yes. But he firmly believed that one could criticize war and one could criticize the administration's handling of and still remain patriotic. Although voices around him said that was not so. That to be questioning the conduct, the purpose of this war was to be disloyal at best.
that same question arises, and you question the foreign policy of the United States and still be patriotic. Or to question the policies of a government, does that call into question your own loyalty? It's something that people have grappled with for years, and yet he's one of the few voices to ask this during the Civil War. He, of course, knew the answer in his own mind. He was clear and he never wavered. That, of course, one could question and still be one. One could be for the Union and still understand that if states wanted to be for any number of reasons, that they could separate out of the Union, that the United States would still exist, even if the Confederate States didn't as well. These are nuanced arguments, as I say. These are not given over to sound bites. These aren't given over to easy or simple quotes. But they reveal thinking of this patriot and what he is grappling with. If, and I quote, the federal government held people for disloyal activities, then of course we are living under just as despotic a government as existed in France under Louis. He goes on to ask, what is the difference between Fort McHenry and the Bastille? If people who are accused of being disloyal can be arrested and imprisoned, where is the American Constitution? This particularly galls him when the administration abandons the rim of Hayden's corpus. The idea that in order to be Jail. One must be charged with a crime. Evidence must be presented. And a grand jury convened and ultimately a trial to be held. But by suspending this fundamental American right, he asks, what kind of country is this? What has become of the Constitution? What has become of the United States? What are we really fighting for? Ultimately, of course, he can take it no longer. In 1863, Charles Sumner of Massachusetts begins a draft of what comes to be known as an ironclad oath. An oath of office whereby members of Congress need to pledge not only their loyalty to the Constitution, but that their loyalty to the United States has remained firm in the past and shall forever be firm in the future. This, he said, was a measure that went well beyond any oath of office that was administered previously. It went beyond the oath of office that the president himself undertakes. After all, it does not allow for one to have changed one's mind over time, to have had one's convictions moved by the change of events in one's life. To take this ironclad oath essentially is requiring one to be dogmatic, both in the past and in the future. He found this important. Ultimately, the oath does pass the Congress. He finds this a reflection of the mood of Congress at the time. A 
January the 25th of 1864, Sumner's ironclad oath passes, and as a result, United States senators are required to take it. Barrett points out its flaws. He points out its unconstitutionality. And then in 29, he promptly takes this oath to note that he is patriotic and loyal and immediately resigns his seat and leaves the United States. This is the courage of one's convictions. It is political bravery that is rare at any time, particularly in our own. But he has the courage of his convictions. It falls to the Delaware Senate, of course, to select his replacement. They choose, excuse me, choose George Reed Riddle for this. But he is unwell and it becomes apparent shortly thereafter that he's not necessarily going to be able to complete his term of office. The war ends, obviously, in 1865. And with Lincoln's death, the process of a very confused reconstruction begins. How to reconstruct the country? We know that Abraham Lincoln had thoughts on this matter. He wanted it to be as simple as possible. And with malice towards him, bring the country back together. His proposal was that 10% of the eligible voting population needing to vote in favor of their state <laughs> readmitted to the Union. We know this because in his lifetime, this is how Reconstruction, putting the country back together, was handled in Arkansas and Louisiana. And indeed, they were able to find 10% of a white male voting population that was willing to seek this reconciliation. But upon Lincoln's death, when Vice President Johnson was sworn into office, all of that goes by the race. And debates on the Reconstruction flourish in Congress. There are, of course, many Republicans who want to punish the South, blaming the South for the bloodiest conflict in the history of the United States. Might have been more people died in the Civil War than have died in all of our conflicts from the time of the Revolution up until the wars in the Middle East today. More people died in the Civil War than all of those other conflicts combined. How do you put a country back together again? Punish the South? Or do you see reconciliation? Well, in Lincoln's absence, of course, a radical reconstruction ultimately became the Nazi. A reconstruction whereby the Confederacy is divided into five military districts to be occupied by the Army of the United States until those states pass certain measures, particularly the 14th and 15th Amendments to the United States Constitution. The 14th Amendment being the amendment that provides a civil equality. The 15th Amendment that provides the right to vote to African-American men over the age of 20. 
And until those southern states advance those amendments, they would remain under military occupation. And it's at that moment in 1867 that Baird re-enters the political fold. It's clear that Riddle cannot finish his term in office. He asks to retire. And the Delaware Legislature Senate asks Baird to resume his duty as the United States Senate. And he does. Once again, he becomes one of the lone voices looking for reconciliation and peace between the states as opposed to beating out punishment. But his voice is drowned out. He knew it would be. Didn't stop him from trying, didn't stop him from being a conscious member of the Senate. But of course, the radicals held sweat. He was no personal fan of slavery, did not own slaves, but believed in states' rights to determine this issue, and feared that at the end of the war, the coming of Reconstruction, that a powerful central government would take the place of the republic that had been foundation of the country earlier in its history. In 1833, as a young man, he had written, I quote, as we value our liberty and independence, we should cherish <coughs> Thank you. 